Hello everyone. Thank you for tuning in and welcome to the third webinar of 2017 sponsored by the Pacific Northwest Aquatic Monitoring Partnership also known as PNAMP. And this webinar is an introduction to how to document methods and protocols in MR.org Monitoring Resources. I'm Sharon Olson. Our goals today are first to introduce monitoringresources.org and cover some terminology of metadata as we use it and mention some great reasons for documenting your data with metadata and then explain how to document your protocols and methods and how to publish them. What is monitoring resources? It is a metadata database. What is metadata? Well, to simplify, it is data about data. And a metadata database is like this card catalog. It's a lot of standardized metadata about a lot of data. And the standards include such things as fields with titles, dates, abstracts, authors, and a locator to data. The monitoring resources is a metadata database, but it is much more. It is a suite of web tools that support monitoring and research design and collaborative metadata sharing. The tools are online and free to use, and the purpose is to promote and support clear, standardized documentation of data collection methods and study designs. We do that using consistent terminology and online tools, so it's an infrastructure to share information. We guide users to plan, implement, and report monitoring projects. We do that with common terminology, consistent documentation. That promotes transparency and accountability. And it facilitates collaboration among many different and varied organizations. Also, people can coordinate data and share data. So the tools streamline the creation of the metadata. All of this leads to integration between systems, trusting the data, ensuring that the data is reproducible and discoverable. So how do we manage such an infrastructure? Well, PNAMP is here to help. Our mission is to facilitate an effective and comprehensive network of monitoring programs based on sound science designed to inform public policy and resource management decisions. Our goals are to increase efficiencies and reduce redundancies among monitoring efforts. So we hold workshops and we host monitoring resources to promote standard usage of metadata and that provides access to metadata and helps partners manage their data lifecycle. So why is it important to document metadata? Good documentation increases the value of data into the future. The volume of data we are working with has become immense and it's increasing, especially continuous data like video footage or even near continuous data like physical parameters such as stream temperature shown here. And we are now into zettabytes of data and more. So data that hasn't been documented well becomes much less valuable over time until it may completely disappear with long-term monitoring programs. Longevity of data is crucial if we are to assess trends or effectiveness over time. And the short explanation is no metadata, no future. There are a lot of other good reasons to document metadata. It provides the data sources and provenance. It's much easier to find and manage and track. This increases our credibility and accountability. This improves our ability to share data and helps us collaborate and integrate data. Those of you who work with Bonneville Power Administration, you know that uh, protocol documentation has been required since 2011, and it's just good science. And we all have common needs. Managers need to make funding decisions based on data that they can find and that's been collected consistently. Um, researchers and data managers use aggregated data. Data repositories that have been documented well with metadata, it is much easier to find the data and to discover that data. Regional reporting is often done at larger scales, so data has to be compiled and aggregated for reports such as a biological opinion report and others. These data management life cycles illustrate data management plans and help organizations manage all phases of data handling. Monitoring resources supports creating robust metadata with tools to help practitioners with all these phases of the data management life cycle. All of these phases require documentation and description, and today we'll focus on the planning phase. And we'll talk about protocols. Now people use the word protocol in different ways. 
but Oakley, Thomas, and Fancy defined protocol for monitoring programs, probably because it was easier than calling it procedures and methodology for conducting effective monitoring programs. So to be sure that we're using the same nomenclature, our definition is from this 2003 article that described best practices for long-term monitoring. And protocol has other definitions, but in this context, it is a plan for monitoring. It is much more than a procedure, and procedures are included in the plan, but also much more metadata, such as spatial and temporal information. And protocols are necessary. This is key to the notion that consistently defined protocols will ensure that changes we detect during monitoring occurred in nature and were not resulting from varied ways of measuring by different people. Protocols have components. These are some of them. To promote consistency among organizations, we use these terms, and I'll define a few of them here. One of the most important components of a protocol are objectives. They're specific and measurable, time-limited and feasible. They're not the broad goals of the project because a project can have several protocols. So, for instance, this objective is too broad to increase abundance. Better to estimate fall juvenile out-migration from Swift Creek. So a study design is an important part of the protocol and it describes either monitoring or experimental designs. This is an explanation of where and when measurements are taken. There is an experimental design section if you're performing research or study, for example, a micro or mesocosm experiment. And then metrics are calculated so that indicators can be determined for meeting your objectives. Metrics are a summary of measurements taken at a site. Indicators are a summary of metrics across sites and temporal periods. Now methods describe how you obtain your metrics and your indicators and they're the standard operating procedure. There are two types, data collection methods and data analysis methods. They describe one technique at a time and it's a stepwise procedure. We like you to use a cookbook one, two, three approach, actually numbered. They're generic. Here are some examples of titles. We like them to be generic so that people can share methods among many organizations. And then we map metrics and indicators to methods. And we do that because you are able to define and name your indicators and your metrics. And the methods are shared, but people name their metrics differently. For example, people could say that they're measuring riparian canopy cover bank canopy cover, shrub canopy. So we categorize our metrics and indicators to standardize what people might name their metrics, and we map them to the methods that are also standardized and consistent and shared in the system. And here's an example of mapping an analysis method. We might map an analysis method to a metric, but because more than one metric can determine an indicator, we may also map that method to that indicator. And I'll talk about mapping in a bit here. This is a component of the protocol, which is simply a self-citation. So let's log in to create a method or a protocol. You log in here with your username or password. If you don't have one, you can request an account. And I'd like to point out first for new monitoring resources users and even people who are experienced with it, the learn section is very useful. I use it often, especially to check terms in the glossary. And we post the 2017 webinar videos here and some other training videos. You can also read some useful frequently asked questions and you can check the glossary. So to create either a method or a protocol, choose document and then choose method or protocol. In this case, we're choosing protocols. And in both cases, you'll get our catalog, a whole list, a library of protocols or of methods. Let me orient you to our catalog here. First, you can sort on any one of these column headings and it will sort ascending or descending for you. You can also search by protocol name if you would like to find a protocol that's similar to what you're doing. You can put in a keyword here. If you are looking for an owner that you know, you can put a partial name here and you can sort 
by that name. For example, I searched on sturgeon and then this column was filtered for me. I found 26 protocols that referred to sturgeons. Note that these columns are drop-down lists. You can also filter by these lists if, for instance, you want to just look at Chief Joseph Hatchery programs. You can choose that one program and see all the protocols for that one program. You can filter by the state here and see just published protocols if you like. And visibility refers to what the owner set for drafts. The owner can decide that everybody can see their draft or just the owner and their colleagues can edit and see their drafts. Now if I want to create a protocol I click on the plus and I have this screen to create a protocol. Titles required, and this is a good title, it's specific, it says what you did to which species and where. This is a bad title. Fish abundance is not very informative. And after you've entered your title, you say create protocol, and you'll have essentially a blank protocol that you're able to fill in, and it will bring you to the edit protocol menu, and the very first item is basics and objectives. Note that required fields have a red asterisk in the edit mode and you can publish a protocol with just the required fields filled in and that's about 60% of the fields. So you don't have to have a 100% completed protocol to publish it. So at this point you have your title. The version was put there for you and yes you can have other versions of a published protocol. And the completeness bar shows that at this point you have 12% of the protocol complete, which is simply a title. Note too that there's an owner here that you can see. The visibility is owner and colleagues, that's the default. The version history shows you if you have other drafts that were versioned. Number of methods, you have no methods attached yet. Referenced refers to how often a BPA contract referenced this protocol. So first, let's go to basics and objectives and start filling in those screens. Additional details is a great thing to use. You can upload a file and that might be an annual report. It might be a published article that includes details about this protocol. Always recommended to upload um, anything you might have that has a more extensive description. And then you fill in a background rationale. This is an abstract basically. If you are a BPA contractor, then your work element description can be copied and pasted right into the background and rationale here. Monitoring program is a drop-down list, and this drop-down list may have your program, but if it doesn't, you can request that it does. Fill in your program, and then your objectives are very important. You add them one by one. They will be numbered for you, so you don't have to number them. Be sure that they're specific, measurable, and feasible, and remember that you will be defining metrics and indicators that describe how you meet those objectives, and the methods will describe how you obtain those metrics and indicators. Remember to save after every screen. Your monitoring purpose, there are just a few choices here, five choices, and you can choose one of those from the system. Save that. Your key assumptions, while they're not required, they might be useful for your organization into the future. Now your study design is your spatial design first. How did you select which sites to monitor in the study area? How many are there? And there are many categories of spatial designs. So Remember that at this point you can jump back out to protocol details and take a look and see what your protocol looks like. Um, and then you can come back to editing the protocol. So here's the spatial design. And if you get to this point and you realize that you need more information from someone else, you could always jump to a different section to fill in. For example, literature cited. If you have filled in your background, you might have two or three references that you need to cite. So you could go fill out that section and come back. You don't have to do these in order. So you describe your spatial design, how many sites that you chose, where they are, why you chose them, and if this is an analysis protocol, you might check this where you're not collecting field data. The scale is binned in two categories. In this case, my scale is less than 25 acres, maybe about five meters squared. I get units here, and I get to choose my spatial design category. And then I fill in my temporal design. There are choices, and you can describe. And this is frequency. How often do you visit your sites? How long is the whole study duration? How do you take your measurements at all scales, whether it's dial, weekly, seasonally? 
And then if you're doing an experiment, instead you do have the choice of entering your experimental design, which includes your hypotheses, brief description, treatment and control groups and sample sizes, and your analysis approach and design. You can say if you use controls and replicates, and if you choose yes here, you'll get a box where you can describe exactly what your control groups are and your replicates. And then you can enter your metrics and your indicators. At this point, remember that you can always find a definition. If you don't quite remember what a metric or an indicator is, you can use this context-sensitive definition and find metrics and indicators here, exactly what they are. You add one metric or indicator at a time, and you title them, and they might look like this. They are a parameter, maybe a variable, and remember that an indicator can be an index or a summary of metrics across space or time. And here you can enter the title. You can title it what you want, but you choose a category from the system, and you can choose a subcategory. And not all subcategories have a focus option one or two. And you can uh, take a look at metrics. If you go to the top menu, pick Explore and Metrics, you can see what the categories and subcategories are in the system. And that might help you to choose your categories and even to name your metrics. And then you can add methods to your protocol. There are three ways to do that. First, you might want to find methods that exist in the system and just add them to your protocol as is. If you find methods after searching that are similar, you can add them to your protocol and you can customize them after you add them. Or you might have to create a brand new method Here's your methods add screen. Add them here, one at a time. Now, because you've entered metrics and indicators, the system says, I see your metric here. I'm going to suggest that you can add these methods. They might work for your metric. If they do, great. You can just check them, save them. But if they don't, you can create a new method. You can save what you have so far and create a new method. You can do that in the system, and if you do this from here, that method will automatically be attached to this protocol. Or you can search for methods, and you get this screen to search. You can search by keyword name, or you can search if you found a method already and you know its ID number, you can search by that. And when you search here, you'll get a drop-down list based on key. We were searching for pit tags here, and then you're able to add them one at a time here, and save them. If you need to create a new method, or if you need to search for methods, you can open a new tab. You can go to Document, Methods, and get our list of methods. This is our catalog that looks similar to the protocol list. Then you can search by keyword name. We found a fish length method. We have a few of them in the system. This is fork length. Looks like this, and you read it, and you think, yes, that's exactly what I do. So I want method 4041 in my system. And we added that right here, measuring fish length. After you add your methods, if you find some that you think were pretty close, but you need to change just a few details, this is where you can customize a method with this little paper and pen icon. And after you choose that, you will get the option to customize either the background or to customize the step-by-step -step instructions and then you can save that customized method. And, and then you can map your methods with your metrics. So here's the menu for mapping metrics, and you see that you have two metrics in this protocol and that they have not been mapped yet to any methods. You have two methods and they have not been mapped to any metrics. You have a warning down here that says you have two methods that are not yet mapped. After you have mapped them, then you'll see how many methods are mapped to each metric and how many metrics are, or indicators are mapped to each method. And as with all of our lists, you can sort these if you like. You can click on metric indicator and sort them. And then when you've mapped all the ones that you need, you'll see a map that looks like this. Notice here that this metric has only data collection methods. This indicator has both data collection methods and a data analysis method, and that this metric has both a data collection method and data analysis method. And I'll show you how metric methods are mapped. Let's say we have a protocol that is this one, screw trap sampling for steelhead smolts in Idaho. We have methods. It's almost complete. 
And we have four methods that are data collection methods, two that are analysis interpretation methods, and then we have three metrics and indicators. We have some of them mapped. We don't know yet if they're all mapped or if they're mapped appropriately. So I'll check that by editing my protocol and clicking Metric Mapping. And then I'll run down and see what my mapping looks like. Remember I can sort and I see that I have two methods that are not mapped to any metric. And this is telling me that I have two methods not mapped to any metric. So all of these need to be mapped. Let's look at my screw trap mark recapture abundance estimate. What I need is abundance and I should map this method to abundance. And then I save it. This successfully saved. And now I have one method not mapped to any metrics. This is fin tissue sampling for genetic analysis. This probably happens when people are processing the fish and I don't see anything that works for me as a metric. So if they're taking fin tissue sampling for genetic analysis, maybe this means that we need to add a metric. And this is the usefulness of metric indicator mapping. I might add a metric that says something like um, genetic sampling for individuals or for species and gender. Uh, we want to say what the parameter is, why we're doing genetic sampling. And so I'll have to go back and add a metric. So then there are fields to complete that are not required but are very useful for your organization into the future. These fields help ensure that you can replicate this protocol many years into the future, even with personnel turnover. Some of this information could be in a method. Your safety considerations might have equipment that could be in a method. Schedule and budget, again, field schedule might be in a method, but if you have specific instructions for people, say they need to get into the field by April, but they need to prepare by December, that's good to know so that other organizations could replicate your protocol or that you could. And budget considerations are there for you to note anything that might be especially expensive or anything that might incur additional travel costs. These citations are citations that are in the protocol and not a whole version of literature cited from one of your reports. And here's your self-citation. There are two ways to have a self-citation. This citation was published elsewhere as a protocol, so it was already published in 1980, and we'll enter all the information for it field by field. Or you can say first published here, and these fields will autofill. You can add another author if you like right here, and it will look like this when people cite it and in the finished protocol. This is very useful and we request and we encourage you to upload files, especially such things as a map of the extent of the study area, photos or images, illustrations or schematics, any diagrams and data collection forms. And even though in your methods you'll have data collection forms, we like you to duplicate them here. These are the states for methods and protocols. It's a status. There are a couple other states. Note here that you can edit your draft or after you request publishing and your draft is in review, you can still edit it. You can set the visibility so that your colleagues can also edit your protocol. But once it's published, the editing is closed. If after field season you need to change your protocol, you maybe added a couple of methods, you can make a version 2. Here's where you request publishing at the very end of the menu. And if you get this notice, it's because you probably left one of the required fields blank. This will also give you a pop-up that tells you why you can't request publishing. Then the PNAMP staff will review your protocol. We'll leave comments, probably pretty detailed, and you have the option to say, eh, no, that protocol is fine as is and let us know why the changes are not warranted. Then you'll get an email notification. And the protocol owners then get a chance to edit the protocol again to respond to review comments and then request publishing again. And a few things to note about protocols. When would you split a protocol into two protocols? It's based on the objectives and the different underlying study or spatiotemporal design, such as if you're using a rotary screw trap to estimate juvenile outmigrants in the fall, 
it is not the same study design and different objectives than conducting red counts. Another feature of a protocol is that you can amend the protocol and create a new version. And when you create a new version, probably the very first sentence should say why you're creating that version and at what point in time. And you can also clone a protocol. If you find a protocol very similar to yours, use this clone button and you want to make sure that you've edited every section. I'll check the full details, the photos, every section because you'll probably have to edit every section. And here's where you can add colleagues to help you edit your protocol. If you add a collaborator, that person can work and edit in your protocol. If you add a reviewer, that person can read your drafts but can't edit protocol. So we're here to help you with training face-to-face. -face. We'll come to your location and with anything else having to do with methods and protocols and using monitoring resources. Here's our contact information and this slide deck is uploaded to pnamp.org so you can have these links. And thank you for joining us.